Hi, everyone. <laughs> nice to be here. Um, I hope you can hear me fine. I have just a normal microphone because I forgot about pockets. So, um, yeah, welcome to our talk about Ember between design and development. My name is Lisa, and I'm a user interface designer. And my passion is like visual design in general, but I also love to bring to life my designs with HTML and CSS. This is Francesco. He's my coworker and our JavaScript developer. And he really loves to write clean and efficient code. But even more than this, he loves to create apps which users really can and want to use. So usually we are from Austria, from the lovely city of Innsbruck, but currently we are on an extended business trip in America to get to know our customers and to conduct some user research. So we are working for the company Cropster. It is a relatively small company which is best based in Austria and Sacramento and we create all tools, tools for coffee traders and farmers but especially coffee roasters. So um, just recently we launched a new Ember Best product which is called Cropster Hub. It is an online green coffee trading platform and also an um, auctioning platform and is totally made out of Ember. And we are also recently redoing our whole inventory management system for coffee um, with Ember. So um, why are we holding this talk today? We have been now working together over three years over on, on multiple Ember apps. And we've just come to realize how important it is that you have a good collaboration between the off the posting groups of designers and developers. We have learned that you can save so much time on existing project, projects, but also on new projects when you have like really good collaboration and documentation. So we want to show you today why collaboration is so important why designers should be able to code and why developers should be able to understand design. How documentation can you help within your collaboration process and which documentation we use in our Ember apps, which is a code documentation, a living style guide and a component guide. Hi. So first of all, why is collaboration so important? Think about the engineering of a car. So Max, designs a nice vehicle body for a city car. It's nice and green, and he's very happy with it. At the same time, Anne develops tires, which are perfect for rough roads. She also put a lot of work into it, and she's equally happy with the outcome. But when the time comes, and they put those parts together, it doesn't work at all. So both did a good job on their own, but they just didn't have the same understanding of the new car. They didn't collaborate well enough. So how can we apply this to our own industry? Many companies have had a workflow like this for a long time. So the designer creates a Photoshop um, design, let's say sitedesign.psd, hands it to the developer, who then implements it with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And many companies have been quite successful with this approach. So why should you care to mix it up? Well, in reality, the workflow doesn't stop here. So there will be the time when the designer needs to do a few changes to the design. So they might create a second Photoshop file, sitedesignfinal.psd, hand it to the developer who has to go through the file, find the changes, and implement them in code. But then there will be another round of changes, and another, and another, and another round of changes. In the end, everyone wasted a lot of time because the designer had to go through the developer for every little change and everyone will be unhappy. So this might have been a bit exaggerated, but I'm pretty sure many of you have experienced something close to this before. So let's imagine a better workflow. Um, this better workflow might still start out with the designer creating a static design with Photoshop. But then the designer also writes the basic HTML templates and the CSS and hands all of this over to the developer, who then um, implements the static HTML templates with handlebars, I'm talking about Ember, and writes the JavaScript logic for it. And when the time comes and they have to do some adaptions, they can work on it together. So it's really just the static design that is the sole responsibility of the designer and the JavaScript app code that is the sole responsibility of the developer. Everything else is shared, all iterations are made in code, the designer um, 
can do especially smaller changes on their own without bothering the developers, and everyone is happy. So, of course, we know that this kind of workflow requires designers, like Kuhn and myself, um, to write valid and meaningful HTML and CSS. Um, but we think that this is really important, because when you're able to write valid and meaningful HTML and CSS as designer, it is not that easily possible that you create a design which is really hard or impossible to implement. So um, regarding Ember apps, we of course also propose that the designer is able to write handlebar templates. And yes, I know when you start to code as designer, you sometimes feel not that confident about it, but. <laughs> but in reality, when you have a basic understanding of HTML, learning handlebars is not that hard. I don't say that you have to create components by yourself or the routes. It, it's great when you can do it. But to start out for a designer, it's just like you have to go into it and just try to don't mess things up the, the developer already made to work. So when you go in here and as designer, I want to change something in the styling of the info message, I just have to know where to put an additional class. I just have to know that, that, that I put the additional class not within the if expression. Or another example where you see this unordered list and with the each loop, the list elements get generated. So as I as designer just have to know when I want to change something, I just do it within the each loop so I don't break something. So the most important thing about that is don't try to be afraid. Just try it out and believe me, the developer is really happy to help you out when you don't know something. So I know sometimes in some project it's, it's not possible that the designer can also like do the whole HTML, CSS code or the handlebars template. But still, it is really important that design specifications are really clear. So let's just take a simple example. Let's just take a button. Um, designers, and yes, I include myself, sometimes complain about, you know, the developers, they are not able to implement this, my design in the way I wanted it to be. But have you ever thought about that designers do not deliver the designs in the way a developer can really work with it? So let's say the button. You get a static Photoshop file as developer. Um, you will just implement it that way. But has the designer also thought about um, what happens in between those two states? So it would be a good beginning if the designer hand this over and say something like, you know, the button should have a transition between all those states. Because an application, of course, is a dynamic application. It would be even better if the designer hand this over and say something like, you know, the button should have a um, transition on the background color, color and the box shadow with our trended standard transition time, which is 0 0.3 seconds and an ease and in out transition. And it would be the best if you could just hand over the SCSS for that. So as long as we're not able to read minds, it is really important that designers deliver design specifications in a way a de developer can work with it. So while we do believe that uh, designers can be expected to know a bit about HTML and CSS, we shouldn't forget the flip side of this. We also strongly believe that we developers can be expected to care about um, design, to analyze it beyond the obvious, and to care about its execution. So of course, I do not expect developers to become the designers. I know that I could never actually design an application, um, but I do think that we can do better than we often do. So when we receive a design from a designer, don't just try to recreate it one to one. Ask yourself, does the design actually make any sense? And is it consistent to other pages or components you implemented before? So chances are the designer did a conscious decision in deviating from another component they designed before. But maybe they just overlooked something. It happens. We are all human beings. So talk to the designer. In my experience, no designer I've worked with so far um, has had a problem with explaining their choices to me if I talk to them in a constructive and nice way. So don't go to the designer and say, hey, this looks really bad or it doesn't work at all. Try to give a concrete example of what the problem is and maybe even a possible solution for a problem. Another thing I want to add is that many developers don't care that much about CSS, but CSS is not that trivial. So I don't know how many of you have felt something like this 
when writing CSS. I know that I have felt like this a lot of times. So CSS is not that trivial, but CSS quality is important. So there are many developers who would spend hours trying to optimize a JavaScript class, but who would then be quick to just throw in a couple of inline styles on a button. Because why not, it works. But it doesn't really work. When the time comes and you have to make changes to the UI, and the time will come, then this will be very hard to maintain. So don't use inline styles, and use some kind of consistent naming scheme for your CSS. So for this purpose, in our project, we use BEM, which is short for block element modifier. I don't want to go into this in any detail. You don't need to use BEM. You can use another naming convention. You can come up with your own naming convention. It doesn't really matter. Just have a naming convention and get everyone in your team on board to actually using it. The last thing I want to mention um, is that the data model does not equal the user interface. So we developers should not build an application in a way that it makes sense to us. We should build an application in a way that it makes sense to the user. And just because we might use terms like items in the app code, it doesn't mean that we should also use these terms in the user interface. So now, as we have complained enough about designers and developers, we want to talk about how documentation can help you to establish an integrated workflow and the shared vocabulary. So why should you do, why should you care about documentation at all? The first thing is, it's all about consistency. Once users know what a specific UI element does in your application, they expect the same UI element to do the exact same thing over and over again. And if the UI element doesn't do that, the users get frustrated, and that's bad. So the other thing is you get really uh, faster and it's easier to do cross-browser testing because when you have like a style guide or a component guide, you can just use that guide uh, in any browser or on any device and test your elements. You don't have to go from page to page and test everything. And when you have something like a centralized hub for your documentation, everyone can go to and uh, you have a faster workflow. Chris mentioned it yesterday in his talk about living style guides. Um, he said it's really easy that you get new developers or new designers um, to help them onboarding. And that's, uh, that's really true. So everyone in your team gets faster. You now might think, okay, that all sounds very good, but how can I do some kind of um, documentation in my company? So the most important thing you should remember from this talk is when you do documentation, and yes, you should do it, um, you should do it always like integrated in your project. What does that mean? It means your documentation should be always 100% in sync with your code base so that you don't stop doing it. But thanks to Amber CLI, this is relatively easy. So the first piece of documentation we use is code documentation. So I'm guessing or I'm hoping that most or all of you use some kind of code documentation in your projects. So what we want to add there is that we also feel it's very helpful to have a standalone human readable code documentation outside of your app source code's comments. So for this purpose, we use UIDoc, which you might have heard of. Um, basically, it creates a nice documentation from Java-doc-style comments in your app. So this is what this looks like um, for one of our projects. Um, we made our own theme for it, which is pretty easy to do. Um, so on the left pane, you see all the classes we have. You can select one class, and then you see all the details on the right pane. If this appears somewhat familiar to you, that's probably because the Ember.js API doc also use UI doc. Um, so it works very well with Ember apps. It's not tied at all to Ember. You can use it with any JavaScript-based project. There is an add-on, Ember CLI UI doc, which you can use, or you can just use the standalone Node version for this. It's pretty easy to use. You just add comments like this on top of your JavaScript files. So we just put there a very short description of what the file does. If it's a component, we like to add a short code snippet of how you would use this component. And then we just define a namespace, which would be the object type, uh, like component, service, etc. then the class name and what it extends from. Then in the class, we just document all the different things in there. So we would document attributes with add attribute and the type we would document methods with add method. We can specify parameters for methods and return values. And um, actions, we 
document them with at event, which is nice because events can also take um, parameters and they show up nicely in a different section in the generated documentation. So the really nice thing about this is that it's not only useful for developers. It can also be used by designers. So for example, if a designer um, is working with a handlebars template, they can use this documentation to find out which properties are available on a model or on a com uh, component to actually use in the template. And while most develop, uh, designers will probably not feel uh, comfortable diving into the app source code to find out which properties are available, going to this documentation and looking it up there is pretty straightforward. So let's talk about the Living Style Guide. Um, Chris had to talk about the Living Style Guide yesterday. Uh, we use it a little bit different. Um, for us, the Living Style Guide is a documentation of our um, CSS classes, how they will look like, and how you can use them. So basically, it's called Living because it is auto-generated from our apps, um, CSS, SCSS, or less. It depends what you use. So um, why are we like doing the living style guide at all? As mentioned before, consistency is really important. And you only realize how important consistency is if you look at inconsistent examples. So when I started with redesigning one of our um, older applications, I started out with a so-called UI inventory. Uh, that means you go into an, uh, in a, into an existing application, look for a specific UI element, and make just a screenshot of it. And every time you see the UI element, which does the exact same thing, you just make another screenshot. So that's what I found uh, when I looked just for a normal button with the same action on it. So as you can see, we have a lot of different button stylings here, but like behind it, every one of those buttons does exactly the same thing. Um, why does this happen? This happens because a lot of people are working on the same project, but, with, but without a shared style guide. So, um, the next step I do when I create uh, a new application or redesign an existing one, I create just a design sheet. So basically it is an outline in which the design direction goes. It includes like a color theme, um, the basic UI elements, some icons, and some other things. But it's really simple. And then I take this design sheet and go to the developer and to the project owner and talk about it. Um, they give me some feedback on it. I iterate over it. And then the next step is, that I directly implement all those UI basic UI elements <coughs> in our living style guide. So how do we do that? We use in our Amber projects um, Broccoli Living Style Guide. We use that add-on because it is especially made for SAS, and we use SAS, so SCSS in our projects. Um, then we make some basic configurations there, for example, like um, how the style guide should look like or and how the code formatting within the style guide should be. And then I can just start create um, sus partials and corresponding markdown files with the same name. And then I can serve our living style guide with um, Amber Surf. And every time when we change something in one of our markdown files or in one of our sus partials, the whole style guide gets reloaded. So we make sure that the style guide, so basically Amber, makes sure that our style guide is always up to date. Then you can just start styling. So when everything is set up, I create my first SCSS partial, which is usually something like button SCSS, and I put all the main CSS in it. Uh, I always then style just the plain tag as well, because you should keep it as easy as, as simple as possible. But I also add on another class like dot button when I want to have like a link look like a button. And I also put all other modifier classes in it, for example, um, button secondary, which just changes the color of the button. When I'm finished with that, I just add a corresponding markdown file, which is called underscore button MD, which has just um, all the HTML markup in it and some description if I want it to be. And then everything gets reloaded and automatically built. And the outcome, as you can see, is um, like you see all UI elements and the uh, HTML markup. And you can just go in and copy and paste this. So this is how our file structure in general look like. We have this core folder where we put all our core styles in, which means those are things which we, which we change from project to project, like variables or our theme or our layout. And then we have um, a lot of files in our modules. Those are things we've learned we can use from project to project and are very similar. 
So like, for example, like basic box stylings or charge stylings or whatever. They just depend on some variables, but we change the variables from project to project. And then we also use like, uh, we put also some of our styles directly in uh, our component folders so we can use the Ember components from one project to another. And another thing we realized while we do a lot of Ember projects, um, oh, yeah, wait, this is how <laughs> actually this die guide looks like. So when it is rendered, um, you can see we also build it in in our um, documentation app. We added on a navigation so you can jump from one part to another. You can see which color variables we use, how you can use input forms, how our buttons will look like. And the cool thing is those are like really the real um, UI elements so you can just try it out, hover over them, like get a feeling how they will look like in the real app. So, and as we work on several Ember projects, um, we found out that all some of our Ember pro projects have the same styling. So we decided to make a shared add-on. This shared add-on contains all our general styling informations. And then all our other Ember projects just use this add-on. So how do we do that in our workflow? We just set the is developing add-on to return true in our add-ons index.js file. And then we create a local copy of our add-on in our Ember project and run this project with Ember Surf. So every time when we change something in our add-ons CSS, also our project, our other Ember project we work on gets reloaded, which is like really helpful during development. So the final piece of documentation we use is the component guide, which sits somewhere in between the living style guide and the code documentation. So Chris, in his talk yesterday about living style guide, what he calls living sty style guide is what we call a component guide, basically. So it shows Ember components in action, how they look like, how they can be used. So it's aimed at anyone that works with templates, so in our case, both designers and developers. Um, and as such, it's important to not become too techy when describing stuff. Um, so it's only really important what a component does and not how it does something. This is what this looks like in our project. Um, so this would be the section for form element, for example. We have a C button component, um, and you can see, I hope you can see, um, there's a list of attributes with a type and a short description that you can use for this component. Then you actually see the component and the code snippet, which shows how you can use the component. So right now, we don't use any special tools for this. This is basically a route in an Ember app with the component in it and the description. But we might switch to Ember Freestyle now after uh, Chris talk yesterday. It was really impressive and nice. Um, so the way we did it now is that we created a very simple component that doesn't do anything fancy. The only thing it does is um, make sure that we have a somewhat unified layout for our component guide. So we put a lot of those in our component guide route um, for basically every one of our components, each one. So on top, you would just define how the component is named. Then we would define all the attributes that this component can take um, with a name and a type and a description. Um, then, and this is actually the most important part, we would include the live component. So you might think that you could just go ahead and copy paste the HTML output of your component from somewhere in your app and put it in here. But that is not a very good idea because it will get outdated um, when you change something in your component. So really try to include your actual components in here. Um, if you're having trouble doing this, that's probably a sign that your components are too tightly coupled to something else, which is something you should avoid anyhow. So actually building a component guide like this is also a good way to find out if you um, build your components in a reusable and encapsulated way. And then finally, we have a, a code block, um, which is basically the same as the demo block, just we escape the, hand, the component, so it is not rendered, and then we add some syntax highlighting to it. So on smaller projects, we basically add a route or a collection of routes just in our app where we put this component guide on. 
Um, this works very well and it's pretty easy to do. However, it has the disadvantage that this will also be served with your app if you deploy it, which is something you might not want. So this is something you need to handle in this case. So what we do is only locked in administrators, which is us basically, can access this uh, routes once we deployed it. For bigger projects, Lisa mentioned it before, we have a couple of internal embed ons that we use um, where we have all our styling, but also all our reusable components that we use in multiple apps. So basically most of our components are in multiple add ons. So we have a separate standalone documentation embed, which also includes all these add ons. And this documentation ember app is our component guide. So um, this is completely separate from our user facing apps. So it can never be deployed by accident. Um, we have set it up in a way that whenever one of the add ons changes and we push it to Git, our build server will rebuild the documentation app, put it onto our internal server so everyone in the team can look at it. And it's always up to date, which is super helpful. We also put the living style guide in this documentation app and the UI doc documentation. So this is our central hub of documentation for all our Ember projects, which works really well for us. So if you take something out of this talk, it should really be try to understand your teammate, teammates. Um, this could only work if you really sit together open-minded and if the developers try to get a little bit involved in the design process and the designers try to get involved in the development process. And if we find together a way which works for everyone. And the most important thing you should remember here is when you do documentation and Again, you should do documentation. Keep it always 100% in sync with your code base. Because when you decide to do a standalone documentation app, trust me, there's, there's a time when you just stop doing it because you just have no time or you just forget about it. And the last point I want to mention is always try to be better. Try to reiterate about your work, uh, over your workflow and, and, and improve it. So even after this talk, we'll probably go home and um, improve our workflow. We have hundred, uh, hundreds of ideas collected here. So um, I would love to come back to the example from the beginning. Just imagine if Max, the designer of the vehicle body, would have been sit together with Anne in the beginning and if they would have sketched out a framework in which the car should work, just let's say a city, the outcome would have been a completely different car. It would have been a perfect one. Thank you. So the question was how much time we spend on keeping it up to date, the style guide? Yeah. Did I, yeah. Um, so it's not too bad if you start doing it from the beginning. It's probably pretty hard if you try to tack it on later. So as Lisa mentioned, we basically um, start coding in the style guide and then we do changes in the style guide and then we look in the app how they look there, something like this. So we always do all the changes in the style guide first, more or less. Um, so that's not really an issue for us. So it's like, I just can give a quick example. Like last week, one of our developers asked me, he, he needed an input with a dynamic label because we just had an input where you can put like a dollar sign or something, but not like a whole word. And he said he would need one with a dynamic label. So um, what we did, we just like improved the existing one in our style guide and then like he used this one for all other things. So we always want to have like the one perfect UI component and we just really do it right in our style guides. So then it's not that much work. I can just like answer like the first step. I come from the client side, so I before I worked just like as freelancer and I did a lot of design projects. And um, I have to say like I switched over to like creating a design sheet first and just like implementing right now in a style guide. So not always with Ember of course, but I did it before, just like standalone style guide with KSS for example. And the outcome was pretty cool because um, 
sometimes when you're like a designer, um, you discuss about things which are like not that important, like the color of the green or like something, a positioning of something which is not that important. And when you start out just with a design sheet and then like directly implement it within a style guide, there is no such discussion about like how exactly you put things. You can really focus on improving your UI elements. So uh, actually I think it works pretty good in, in agency, agency wise as well. Also a thing I want to add here is that this will, a thing like this will probably, um, it will be worth it a year from now basically. So when a year from now the client comes back and wants to do some changes and maybe there are new developers who will work on this project who haven't worked on it before, so they have basically no idea what you did now. Um, if they have something like a style guide, they can go there and work from there. If they don't have something like this, it's basically do whatever you think is best and this is something you can really help with when you have a style guide. I just can say as designer in general, when you wanted to be a user interface designer, you have to be able to code. It's, it's not a limitation, it's like an extension of your skills. just the example I gave in the beginning. Um, when I make a user interface, I really have to think about animations and transitions and not only like the static button. So I think you have to learn code. Okay, thank you. Oh, sorry. No, oh, sorry.